Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for being here for our gardening series with CSU Extension Water and Weeds. My name is Rachel Bloom with the CSU Alumni Association and I am super excited to bring this wonderful webinar to you all. A big thank you to our series sponsor Fossil Creek Nursery. We'll be including their website in the chat if you're interested in learning more. Go ahead and switch my screen to our gardening series slide. Uh, please go ahead and add to the chat where you are watching from and what year you graduated. And if you can be sure to click all panelists and attendees, then everybody can see your message. Wherever you may be tuning in from, we are so glad that you're here. You may also be noticing my colleague Dakota. She is in the chat and she'll be providing some resources throughout. So thanks Dakota for being here tonight as well. Also, many of our attendees are CSU Alumni Association members, so thank you so much for your membership. It makes different events and engagement opportunities possible, and if you're interested, we'll include some more information in the chat about membership for you. As a reminder, since this is a webinar, you are automatically muted with your camera off, so please utilize the chat or the Q&A feature to communicate with us. We will try to have some time for questions at the end as well. And then in just a moment, my colleague Dakota will also include a helpful article with my contact information if you need any technology help, as well as we have a lot of upcoming virtual event opportunities, so we'll include that link to our website. We'll also send out the recording of this webinar with some additional resources and the recording, which I already said, but I wanted to make sure you know you'll get the recording uh, to this webinar in case you missed it or want to refer back to this awesome content. And then later on in the event, I'll be including a survey link in the chat. So if you could please take a moment to fill that out, let us know how we're doing. And if there's any topics you'd love to see for another event, that always really helps us as well. The slide I have up right now is about CSU Extension's Master Gardener Program who established Grow and Give in 2020 as a modern victory garden project in response to heightened levels of food insecurity resulting from the COVID-19 pandemic. So now the Grow and Give program continues to address food insecurity in Colorado by connecting backyard and community gardens to food donation sites across the state. So definitely check that out. We'll include the link in the chat. And Susan here, our wonderful guest speaker, is a wonderful resource as well if you have questions about that. So you're not here to hear from me. You're here to hear from our wonderful guest speaker, Susan Carter, who is the horticulture and natural resource agent for CSU Extension Tri-River area, covering Mesa, Delta, Montrose, and Uray counties. Susan, it is such a pleasure to have you here with us tonight. Thank you so much. I'll let you take it away. All right. Thank you, everybody, for joining us this evening. And let me uh, share my screen here. And so tonight we're going to be talking about weeds and water and how they're interconnected. I'm, I think kind of everything in the garden's connected, but uh, I, and I wanted to give you a little more background. So I've been with CSU Extension for seven years now. And before that, I even volunteered for them. They did a landscape show with the Associated Landscape Contractors of Colorado. And I uh, was instrumental in helping with that show. My son is actually a student at CSU. He's a senior and he's working on his degree in economics with the minor business administration. And anyway, I have a bachelor's in ornamental horticulture and a master's in landscape architecture. I have worked in the green industry. I'm not gonna tell you how long, but uh, started in eighth grade in a career day. And I absolutely love the outdoors. So my family loves to hike and camp and do all kinds of things. And uh, I did really well fishing the other day and uh, beat my husband. So um, anyway, and I'm trying to get my, there we go, I was not advancing. So you probably are aware and have heard this, but uh, our whole state is in drought. Um, in, I'm way over on the west side of the state, which you can see we're in the red. So we're in extreme to exceptional drought. So things are not looking really good this year so far. Um, so we're hoping that we get some more of these spring snows and rains uh, to kind of bolster the available water coming from the mountains. 
uh, the soil is so dry that it's going to be probably sucking up some of that moisture. So we're not predicting that all the moisture from the melt is going to make it into the rivers and into our irrigation systems here. So um, anyway, we're, we're hoping that improves. But um, connected to the weeds and part of what I teach is native plants. And I think native plants are always a great way to save water. And they certainly can be impacted by drought too when the drought is so extreme. So I have responded to like a lot of pinion pines with insect issues because of the drought, things like that. I hear kind of daily uh, in my daily office work uh, and I do site visits as well. Uh, but native plants typically are, are adapted to our climate. They typically do do pretty well, um, you know, with some light minor droughts and stuff like that. But it, the problem is we've had them back to back. So it's been even extreme for them. But part of our native plant master's classes, we actually talk about uh, landscape sustainability and weed management. And I'm going to show you uh, this video today. So I'm going to actually stop sharing and then reshare to bring this video up. And so this is a video um, that I did for the Native Plant Masters program. And Rachel and Dakota, let me know if we don't hear this. I can survive in the environment that you're living in and that it has a long life to it, that it's not something that just is here today, gone tomorrow, but something that's, that's gonna be with you for a long time. Um, something that's not invasive, so it's not going to just take over the whole area, um, but it's going to live uh, in unison with other plants and, and the environment and the insects. Some of the things that the Native Plant Master program can do to impact um, population growth in urban areas would be to replace habitat. So usually when a new development goes in and new houses are put up, or even older established areas, there's lawns and other very non-diverse, non-productive land. And so by doing the development that we've done over the years, we've taken away habitat that used to be great for pollinators, for birds, for other animals. And so if we replace the yards um, that were either traditionally in lawns or in a newly developed uh, area then and we replace them with native plants we can actually restore some of the habitat that has been lost so we can actually really do a lot to mitigate um, some of the population growth and some of the habitat loss that's happened. But if we're using native plants that are more drought tolerant or, or placing them in places because sometimes we do have wet areas using wet plants for wet areas right plant right place um, then they're going to be happy, they're going to live longer, they have a more, more of a balance with the natural insects that are here. So we don't seem to see as much ebbs and flows or explosions of insects uh, with the native plants. So it, it's good to keep them in mind when you're landscaping. Um, you know, and they, they give us that feeling of place too. It's not just that they're providing a landscape with low water use, but they make it look like the West. All right, let's go back to the PowerPoint. Oh, I am sorry. Series. Uh oh. <laughs> always how it is with those YouTube videos. It always takes a second. You're doing great. And I love the video. Okay. Is that one going to go off? I don't know how to. Maybe just closing the, the browser to the video might help. Okay. I had the same thing happen to me the other day. It just uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> this video. There we not... go. Sorry about that, guys. <laughs> you are totally fine. It looks great. And then, yeah, I think you'll okay. have to minimize that web browser because that's what we're seeing right now. Instead of okay. There we go. Perfect. We're back to the slide now. Okay. <laughs> yeah, a little bit of excitement there. So, oh, yeah. anyway, but we teach weeds as part of our native plant program. So, that's why I integrated that into this. And I think thinking about, you know, sustainability has kind of become one of those buzzwords, but we've been using it with native plants for a long time. And I think we do want to sustain that native landscape. So, 
So why are weeds important? Well, and what is a weed? Well, a weed is a plant out of place and it's really kind of a human definition, um, but we look at weeds as anything that was introduced, you know, in the last few hundred years that was not already here. And so uh, oftentimes these plants might interfere with the management objectives of a parcel of land or a given uh, time. It can also pose maybe a health or safety hazard. They could be poisonous. Um, they can uh, also affect what we're growing. Um, they tend to outcompete the desirable plants um, and they might be visually unattractive. Some of them don't look too bad, but others, you know, pretty messy. And they can be a host or shelter for other pests like diseases, uh, insects, um, food for, you know, they might uh, actually take over and destroy food for our natural wildlife. And because they're not native from here, they often don't have uh, the pests and things. So they're, they're kind of out of balance. So there's, they uh, affect that sustainability. So anyway, uh, that is kind of the basics of a weed and what is a weed versus a noxious weed. So a weed, as I said, is just kind of a plant out of place. So it could be in the garden, your lawn, flower bed, wherever, uh, such as like a dandelion, which by the way is found worldwide now, came from Europe. Um, but a noxious weed is designated by the state as a weed that is a threat to us. So it's either threatening the environment or agriculture and then it's broken into uh, kind of different classes. So if it's a, a class, then it's something that they're focusing their effort on. Maybe it's newer to the area and they can kind of hit it hard and um, knock down that weed. Um, the B ones are ones they want to keep from spreading and C ones are maybe ones that are here that yes, if you have it on your property, we'd like you to control it, but it maybe is so out of control that we're kind of waiting for uh, new method. So it could be maybe a biological type of um, control that we're looking for, things like that. And of course, budget, you know, comes into controlling the weeds as well on a statewide level. Um, so here's those uh, list A. So if you have a list A, and these are all listed on the um, state of Colorado website, then we want to eradicate it. So we want to get rid of it, not let it spread. B, we're kind of controlling and suppressing. And C, we're developing a management plan. Um, it's here. So again, you wouldn't want it to come new into your property. Um, but, you know, we just don't have that good tool maybe to eradicate it or really suppress it. So weeds succeed because they tend to be rapid growers. Uh, they tend to have a prolific amount of seed that they put out year after year. Uh, some of them will spread from root systems like the snapweed in this picture. So they're sending out suckers all over the place and they adapt and spread very quickly by wind, water, animals, and human activity. And they, they often outcompete the good plants for light and nutrients. And so they're just not as good for our environment as uh, something that's native. Tamarisk here in this picture, uh, it was actually brought over um, to kind of help with erosion. So we have different reasons that we, weeds got here, but it vast, you know, it very fastly uh, exploded and uh, it's found all along our waterways. And the problem with it is it does undermine waterways it does drink a lot of water and it also brings salts to the surface, making the soil more salty. And so then good plants can't grow as well there. And then you get other noxious weeds moving in. So even if we control this plant, we've now realized that we have to have a management uh, in place to manage the property that it's affected. And then this one is controlled by beetles. Uh, we actually have the Palisade Insectary uh, it is a Colorado Department of Ag uh, institution, and they actually produce insects that eat certain weeds and, and uh, control things. So they have a little beetle and it takes it about three years to eat the tamarisk until it dies, um, or so they can suppress it, so they can use other methods to get rid of it. But we are so lucky because uh, there's only three of these insectaries in the United States and we have one in Colorado. 
So how do these plants get here? I kind of mentioned that maybe erosion might have been one way we brought them here. Um, they, they can come in um, just as we spread them around. It could be from nursery stock. It could be from seed. So if you buy some really cheap grass seed, then there's probably a higher amount of weed seed in it. And so there's kind of a reason to look for like certified weed free uh, stock when you're buying seed and things like that. It can be brought in from wind, uh, animals and water. And of course, if you bring in soil, manure, or other amendments, if it wasn't properly composted, you could have weed seeds coming in. And then history, uh, our ancestors might have brought things here as uh, from, you know, for livestock foliage. So some of the grass, grassy weeds that we have, they were worried about not having enough here for things to eat. So they brought their own grasses. Well, behold, and they became really bad weeds here. And then we talk about the seed banks. I get the little pink piggy here. And so the soil has seed in it, right? Over the years, there's been seed uh, that's come in one way or another. And as we disturb that soil, oftentimes we, we bring that soil up uh, or to the top um, or things change. And then next thing you know, these weeds are coming up. And it could be that just it was the right uh, circumstance for them to come up. Some of these seeds, as you'll see in some of my slides, will, will hang around for a long time. So seeds um, have their ways of disseminating. Some of them might have tufts of hair uh, on them so they can float away in the wind. Um, they can have little pickers on them so they can take a ride on your pants or your shoes or your pets. Uh, even planes, trains, and automobiles can carry seeds. Nursery stock, of course, um, I always... I always tend to weed my plants when I'm in the nursery before I bring them home. Uh, so I'm not bringing the weeds home. Uh, ornamental um, trade. So, you you know, weeds can, seeds can come in on all kinds of different things. Livestock and wildlife can move them. They might eat something and then move and then it comes out in their manure. Um, and then waterways. Things do float through the water and down the waterways. And of course, mach machinery, hay, and other commodities can move these seeds as well. So why is it important? Well, you can see there's a lot of ways these weeds affect us. They're going to reduce uh, yields of crops and maybe even the yields of maybe your own vegetable garden. It's going to reduce the quality. It's going to increase cost, right, because we have to control these weeds. It's going to increase labor and equipment use. They're hosts for insects and diseases uh, that then can move on to other plants. Some might be poisonous or irritating to us. Um, some weeds, for example, you don't want to burn because you can actually like inhale. Some of the nap weeds are really bad, can, uh, bad for your lungs, so you don't want to burn them. And it can increase your uptake in, you know, lawns, gardens, uh, vegetable gardens, maintenance. Um, you know, is increased overall in the whole community. And it reduces land values, right? Things just don't look as good when it's covered with weeds. And it can also change the wildflower cycle. So I'm gonna talk about that when we get to some special uh, weeds and threatens wildlife as well as changing the soil. And so anyway, this is a scary, I think, uh, chart here. You can see how some of these weeds can really put out some seeds. So. Uh, bindweed, that's one that looks like a morning glory. It can grow in grass or beds, and it seems like it roots uh, down to the other side of the earth. It, it has a very long viability, so it can live 50 or more years, and it produces 25 to 300 seeds per plant, which in comparison to some of these others isn't too bad, but when you consider you start with one plant and you might end up with 300 plants, that can be a little bit scary. Uh, kochia is a big plant that we have, especially over here, it breaks off. It's one of our uh, false tumbleweeds over here, and it spreads, you know, up to 30,000 seeds. And uh, the, luckily, their viability, though, is pretty low. So those seeds only last about two years. So that's a really good thing. So if you can keep them from reseeding over a couple years, uh, like I use a pre-emergent at work because we have four and a half acres at our extension site over here. I think we have one of the biggest gardens. If you get over to Grand Junction, come visit. We have fabulous uh, 
Ute Learning Garden and a cactus garden, as well as a bunch of demonstration gardens. I have over 80 trees. So anyway, really fun place to come visit, but we do fight the weeds just like everybody else. And by using a pre-emergent, which uh, this allows them uh, to, once they're germinating, it kills them off. Um, I've pretty much wiped out kochia. So it's been really good because when I first uh, came to extension, we had a kochia issue. So um, that has gone away. And then prickly lattice, um, I'll talk about different types of weeds, but it's a biannual. So it takes two years for it to grow. And there's a picture of it. It's actually in the sunflower family. It puts out lots of seeds. You can see up to 46,000, depending on the number of flower heads that are on the plant. So not good. Uh, here again, here's more seed counts. Um, you know, pigweed. Oh my goodness, pigweed's got, you know, over 200,000 weed seeds. So you can see again how you want to get the weeds when you first see them. So if you see something strange pop up in your yard, uh, take a picture of it or pull it out and take it to the local extension office and ask them, what is this? Um, or you might send a picture, uh, email. I know some of our offices are still not quite open yet because of the situation, but so seed dormancy is kind of dependent. Like I said, they're going to wait for that perfect time before they'll germinate. So it could be a freeze thaw. Uh, and maybe a moisture event that gets in the germinate. In some cases, it might even be fire or smoke. Um, so we might see some weeds coming up, unfortunately, in the fire areas that we had last year. And I did, I was actually very involved with the Pine Gold fire and still am over here, which very temporarily was one of the largest fires here, now the third largest in Colorado. Uh, but temperature and light have to play. Genetics uh, comes into, you know, what you know, what affects these seeds? Why do they come up? But they have these survival techniques of, you know, how are they going to make it? And so they have that innately built in. There's also then induced dormancy. So it could be maybe it's growing in a hot spot and that extra heat is going to get them uh, to wake up and, and germinate and grow. It could also be, you know, sort of that biological clock that's built in like, okay, I, I better grow. It's time for me to grow. And of course, uh, temperature, soil temperature has a lot to do with it. And believe it or not, so does carbon dioxide. So if it's high carbon dioxide, some of these weeds will come up. And then there are things like the fireweed shown in this picture. And fireweed has a lot of connections to fire. It's supposed to bloom during the fire season. And then we weren't sure at first why it always would be so prevalent after a fire, especially in the mountain areas. But it's that exposure to the soils that allows them to come up. They were thinking maybe the heat or maybe even the smoke. Uh, might have something to do with why that seed coat, um, you know, kind of gets stratified and allows it to come up and to grow. Um, but anyway, just knowing that there are some environmental conditions um, that can kind of cause these plants to then germinate and become uh, predominant. Sometimes we might call a native plant weedy or a weed. I like to say weedy versus a weed because they are native and they just might be in the right situation that they do so well and they might not do well elsewhere. Um, this is a lot of the brown heads here are some penstemons that are going to seed. And I guess years ago we had a complaint from a guy that was raising sheep because the he thought it was weed because the sheep didn't like to eat it. So it's all in our human perspective of what is a weed or not. But um, temp, typically we do not call natives weeds. Um, I do have an aster though that's in our gardens. And typically it's a very well behaved aster in you know the more desert deserty areas, but you add water and it does kind of spread all over the place. So and then here's one too. This is a native, but it likes it hot and dry. So believe it or not, there's certain weeds that I only see kind of in times of drought. And this is one of them. It's the curly cup gum weed and it is gummy. Um, so when you touch it, um, that's where that gum weed com comes from. But this is another one that's in that sunflower. You can see the lower picture there. It kind of looks like a sunflower. So it's in that Asteraceae family. And 
Um, knowing the families kind of helps us figure out identification. This is a fabulous book, which is now out of print, um, but you can go to uh, Wyoming State. So if you just um, Google Weeds of the West, Wyoming, you should be able to find the PDF and download it. And it gives, it's got great photos. I'm hoping that they'll reprint this in the future because we use this, the Master Gardeners use this all the time in our office. Um, we have, uh, one of them was complaining to me the other day, like, oh, look, this Weeds of the West is pretty beat up. Should I throw it away? I'm like, no, they're out of print. Please keep it. Um, but anyway, great, great resource. Um, so I would download it and uh, keep that PDF handy if, if you have some weeds to ID that you want to try to look at yourself. And so why do we want to identify them? Well, there's reasons why. It's because there's different types of weeds just like we have annual flowers and perennial flowers, we have annual, biannual, and perennial weeds. And so that helps us determine how we're going to manage them. So it could be a summer annual, which means it would come up once that soil gets really warm in early summer, or a winter annual, believe it or not, comes up in like August, September over winters they're now already going to seed so i have some grasses already that i'm seeing going to seed um, because they made it through the winter and then we have biannuals um, perennials and then you can see there's simple ones creeping ones and ones that are a little bit more woody so so here's an annual so a true annual has a one-year life cycle so it comes up from seed it might do it all in the summertime so it might germinate early spring and summer and then go to seed and fall and it completes its whole life cycle um, so here you can see some uh, russian thistle here coming up and when it first comes up it almost looks like a little evergreen or something with those long uh, kind of almost pine looking needles but they're actually leaves that further down the road get pickers on them and then that is one of the false tumbleweeds that we have and it spreads the seeds that way so um, so even knowing what they look like when they're young this is kochia I kind of mentioned the kochia this is again one of those false tumbleweeds that breaks off and blows everywhere on a good moisture year I have seen these uh, eight foot tall or more uh, on a drought year though they're going to be a little bit shorter but they're still going to come up so winter annuals, there's quite a few grasses that are winter annuals. Uh, the top picture here is hair barley. Um, you can see it kind of looks like it would be a crop, but this is a weed and it spreads. Uh, you can see along the field here, it likes kind of waste areas. And again, this is one that comes up in the fall and then in the spring it will go to seed and so by summer it's already dry and so when we have droughts a lot of these dry grasses can really kind of be a fire danger um, but you know they end up looking like this this is cheatgrass another winter annual um, this one has changed the fire cycle in the west by itself it is a noxious weed in all 50 states um, and it is found in many other countries as well. And so looking at this, it's good to kind of know when it's going to germinate. So it's germinating in August uh, to October. I've seen it out here in Grand Junction as early as August 7th already germinated. So I try to put a pre-emergent if I want to pre uh, prevent that germination. I do that, try to do it by August 1st. So knowing that timing is really important. This is when it's growing, so it's really active in fall, and then it kind of sits in stasis throughout the winter. And then as soon as it starts warming up towards the spring months, it really takes off and starts growing. And then it flowers, and like I said, I'm already seeing flowers. And then it goes to seed, and then it dries out and it becomes a fire hazard. So areas that have um, been more sagey, I'll go back uh, to that brown like this areas that used to have sagebrush in it which are actually really good for things like sage grouse and other things um, they would normally burn about every 75 years because of this weed this area like this could burn every five to seven so not 75 but five years so quite a difference um, in that habitat a big environmental change um, this is a mustard. We have quite a few weedy mustards 
We do have to identify them though. This is flixweed on the right. We actually have a native one as well. Um, so we do have to be careful over here in Grand Junction because we have the native and the non-native and the foliage looks just a little bit different. So uh, we make sure that we don't tell people to get rid of the native one because it's not nearly as invasive as the non-native. So biannuals are a two-year plant. So the first year they're gonna come up, they're gonna germinate either in spring or fall. Then you're gonna have this rosette the first year. So you, oftentimes people might not even really notice them depending on where they are because they're just kind of this flat little thing of green. And then the second year they'll actually grow and bloom and go to seed and then die. And then the seed will start all over again that two year cycle. So it's that uh, every two year cycle, but you can see the thistles, a lot of the thistles do this. Um, again, believe it or not, they're also in that sunflower family. Um, so each flower that we think of as one flower is actually a flower head. And so that's why they produce so many seeds. So if you think of a sunflower and all those sunflower seeds in the sunflower, um, that's the same with that family. Burdock is another one that would be biannual. So we're gonna see just the leaves one year and then it will bloom and go to seed the second year. Same thing with hound's tooth or hound's tongue, excuse me. And you can see this poor hound ha does have the seeds kind of stuck to its tongue. So I don't know if that's where it got its common name, but it might be. Um, but this is one strategy for it to spread its seed. It's using the animal to move the seed. Um, and some people think this is pretty, which I think it kind of is, but you can see how many seeds it, you know, it puts out. And unfortunately, that poor dog is going to have to go through some major grooming um, to get rid of those seeds. Some are just simple perennials. So they're going to come up from seed. They're going to exist and come back from that root system year after year. And so, you know, they might live 20 years or something like that. So they're going to complete their life cycle. Uh, by fall and then they'll go dormant for the winter. So kind of similar to a lot of our common plants that we have in our gardens and it can die down and then kind of start all over from the root system. Um, so curly dock would be one of those. We do have a native dock. So again, this is something that we do really identify to make sure that we're not getting rid of a uh, native and or maybe you think it's a native and it's actually a weed. So either way there. Creeping perennials, so a lot of these will send out root systems and you'll end up with a big patch of them. And so if you do not uh, treat these right, say if you just mowed these, they would just put more out. Or if you just dig, try to dig these up, you can break the root off and then you make more. And so this is another way that they can spread. And this is another reason why it's important to know the type of weed that you have so you can have the best management strategy. So something like this, it might be better to, you know, spray it with a pesticide. Um, there are also, uh, there's a rust now that actually helps with like Canada thistle um, that over time will kill it. And that again, that one's actually carried by the Palisade Insectary. So they're even doing some work with some um, different types of diseases that affect weeds too, which is kind of cool. So just thinking about that root structure, um, you know, knowing what that what that weed has. If if it's just a, a simple tap root, you might be able to get the whole thing out by digging it up. Um, but if it's spreading by rhizomes or stolons, um, you might be, like I said, breaking off babies and making more of them. So uh, here's some nap weed that's spreading, and more. Just like a whole field of it. So it's going to take quite some management to take care of that. And then this is hoary crest, also called white top. Uh, I live in Fruta, Colorado, and I think a lot of people think this is a native because unfortunately they've let it go. And this is one that's kind of hard uh, to treat. And so it's hard to get rid of, but it is kind of pretty when it blooms, but the rest of the year it's not so pretty, so. Woody weeds, so we have a lot of woody weeds. Unfortunately, a lot of these occur along the river. I've already talked about tamarisk is one of them. So they, these are gonna be like trees or shrubs. Uh, Russian olive is one too. And the problem with these is they replace uh, willows and cottonwoods and other high value uh, native plants that feed our native wildlife. 
And so they're just not as valuable. They do change the soil. There's really new, uh, there's great new research out now that, that a lot of these can put a chemical out and prevent things from coming up. So uh, Russian knapweed is one example of that where it's something called alleliopathic, where it's putting out a chemical that prevents other plants from growing. Um, you have things like the tamarisk that bring more salts in, so that changes the soil. Well, now we're even finding out that they change the microbes. And some of these weeds will actually kill off the good microbes and make it harder for the natives to grow. Um, so sometimes just something simple like adding some compost back into the soil will kind of um, refresh some of those uh, microbes and bring it back. So I already talked about the cheat grass and how that affects us. Um, you know, it does take that fire cycle again from 75 years down to five years. And then this is a picture of the Pine Gulch fire. This is one that my director took the picture of, but believe it or not, where it's flat here, that had been sagebrush that was really old. It was like five to eight feet tall. And you can see now it's just down to dirt. Um, so there's just ash there. So unfortunately we're you know, going to have to be watching for weeds and things in these areas because they're opportunist. And um, so after the ash is kind of moves, because some of that will come off of the fire sites, um, then we can replant. And there were some grasses and things like um, Thamble Oak that were coming back last year in the areas that didn't burn as hot, um, but areas that it burnt hot and long, there was just nothing by last fall still coming up. So kind of sad story there, but something that the drought has brought here, um, just the plants were so dry, the native plants that, um, I mean, when the humidity within the plant was less than 8%, I was like, you know, how is it even alive? It's just amazing. So hot weather can impact weeds too, it impacts their germination and their growth and their development, um, it might improve. It might be a plant that's actually acclimated to more drought, or it might be one that's gonna sit and wait till we get those cooler moisture temperatures. And then small uh, seeded weeds, if there is more drought and you have situations like, like the fire picture I just showed you, um, and if light's getting to the soil, those a lot of those seeds are within the soil surface down to maybe half an inch then they're going to come up and then that's going to compete with our crops and stuff for moisture. So it's really important to con control them because of that, because they are competing with for moisture. And dry weather can complicate um, weed control efforts, harder to pull them out. I know I had a situation like this where some weeds were in the gravel and I was trying to pull them out by hand and I thought, boy, I really need to go get my dandelion digger because it's just breaking off because it's so dry. I really can't pull it out of the ground. So it's affecting us that way. And they also, um, you wanna control them when they're small. Um, there's reasons for that because at, when it's so hot, they'll actually get waxier. Um, so they kind of develop a wax layer on them to prevent that evaporation from happening because of the heat. So we want to control them when they're young, as well as if we're using any kind of chemicals, we want to read the label. And typically most of them should not be applied over 85 degrees, uh, or you can be kind of volatilizing them and they can move as gases and, and affect other plants. So always read the label. I'm being a good extension agent here and telling you, read the label, it's the law. Um, so, and don't do double, if it says a certain rate, use that rate, it's uh, developed to work that way. If it didn't work that way, you know, they wouldn't, they wouldn't want to put it on the label because you're not going to buy it again if it didn't work. So anyway, so uh, weeds are best uh, treated with herbicides when they're young. So the sooner you can get them when they're young and immature, the better, uh, just because you're gonna avoid that kind of waxy layer that they're gonna develop as they age. Um, so water conservation, um, we do wanna keep our lawns and things healthy if we can, depending on the drought that we have, if we have any restrictions on water, I'm sure all of you would follow that, um, but just knowing kind of what is natural too, I think is helpful to know. So lawns, as you can see from this chart, are growing the most in spring and fall, in that late fall when it's cooler. So most of our cool season grasses like uh, 
Kentucky bluegrass and perennial ryegrass, some of the fescues, they're all cool season grasses. So we naturally kind of force them to be green all summer long. They would naturally actually kind of go dormant in summer for about six weeks. But instead we're watering and we're fertilizing. So we're kind of keeping them green, um, but they can go dormant for a while and still be okay. They can come back and, you know, after six weeks with some water and still be alive if they're established and have a good root system. So we want to use some watering regimes um, to keep these grasses healthy, to get them deeper watered. So less frequent deeper watering is going to get those roots down. And also if we water every day, we're displacing oxygen. So they're not going to be as drought tolerant because the roots are going to be up higher uh, because they need that oxygen. So, so just kind of knowing the growth period of the good plants that you would keep is, is good to know too in this time of drought. Here you can kind of see um, longer grass on the house uh, with the brown trim versus the house with the red trim. And that's actually a good thing. If we mow taller, we say three to three and a half inches, um, then that's going to actually shade out weed seeds. So they're more, less likely to germinate um, so you're going to have a healthier lawn that way. So by keeping your lawn healthy and taller, you're using less water and you're going to have less weeds. Um, so, you know, use these practices to kind of help you. Aeration is really great. Do some coration right now, now in fall, spring and fall is a great time to do that. That's actually the way we dethatch. We do not use a dethatcher anymore, but that's going to allow air to get down into the root system. And then if you fertilize after that, some of the fertilizer might fall in those holes as well. So really run over it quite a few times with the core aerator to get as much uh, aeration in there and kind of helps with the root system. Wanted to make sure you know that, you know, xeriscaping has a lot of people have pronounced it zero scaping. It's not a zero, it's zera for dry and it can be really pretty. And you can have lots of really great low water plants However, when we're in times of drought, we don't want you to change your landscape. We want you to smartly water and be conservative with when you water. Uh, I, for example, I typically only water my lawn once a week, maybe twice in July when we're hitting over 100 over here. Um, but I don't water my lawn very often, but when I do water it, I get that water down. And I really focus more on my trees because the trees are really important. Um, but think about, you know, how can you maybe slowly change your watering regime uh, to make your lawn a little more drought tolerant, get those roots down and conserve water, and then plan for maybe the next moist period that we have that maybe you can take some of the lawn out and put some more zero scape uh, low water type plants in and get them established. But to rip something out now and put something new in, the something new, even though it's uh, xeric or low water, is going to need moisture. So we say even a cactus needs water to get established. So one side effect we're seeing of the drought, unfortunately, is a lot of our trees are really suffering because people don't realize how big the root system of the tree is. So I wanted to put a picture in here, a diagram of the root system. Basically, your root system's in the top 12 to 18 inches of the soil, and it's wide spreading, very wide spreading. So think of the tree's width, and the, the roots are at least twice that, or you can take the height of the tree and the roots can be out two to five times the height of the tree. So if you have a 20 foot tree, those roots could be expanded out to a total of 100 feet. So think of where all those roots are. And to me, roots are such, um, trees are such a big investment that we wanna make sure that we're watering that area. And the area outside of the canopy of the tree is the most important to water. You get a little bit underneath the tree, but really that's, not where most of the feeder roots are, they're out further out. Um, the trees are made to kind of shed water. So the water that shed goes out to those roots that are growing out further so they can find more nutrients and moisture. So make sure that you're watering your trees like that, um, that you're you know, sprinkling them or adding all kinds of like a network of drips if you're on a drip system. 
um, to water those tree roots. And, but they don't need it that often, depending on the type of tree you have. It might need it every 10 days, every 20 days, or for something like a pinion pine, once a month, a good deep watering, and they're good to go. And that's all you have to do. And for grasses, if you can get your lawn down to at least every three or four days in midsummer, like I said, July should be your peak watering. Spring and fall, you should be maybe a 10 day cycle for watering your lawns, depending on your soils and your site, um, then do that. So families of weeds um, are really important. Uh, I mentioned a little bit about the Asteraceae family, that sunflower family. Um, so knowing the family of the weed is important. It helps us to identify it, right? And it also helps to control it. Um, so I just wanted to show you a few weeds that we have um, that are really drought tolerant, kind of deserty, but do really well in this drought type of time. Um, some of them are the chenopods or the goosefoot family and it's the Tenopodiaceae family. Um, ACA is always on the end of a family name. So if you see that ACA, you know, they're talking about the family of plants, um, but it has some inconspicuous flowers. This is one to, typically towards the end of summer, people bring me, you know, what is this plant? Um, and so we have, oh, I'm trying to remember here. Um, this is Halogeton, the top one. Um, so it's a deserty plant uh, that gets these really kind of spiny flowers later on, but it looks really succulent. Uh, the kochia I already talked about, so that's fairly um, drought tolerant. Again, it's in that Chenopodaceae family. The Chenopods, uh, their flowers are pretty inconspicuous, so it's really not a pretty uh, plant. And hard to see here, but there's little seedlings all coming up, these darker red spots all over the soil there are um, plants, little seedlings coming up. And then again, the Russian thistle on the, the left-hand side there. Um, this is a, a buffalo burr. You can see it's got these stickers on it. This always comes up. People don't notice it and all of a sudden, boom, they have this little bushy weed coming up in their property and it, very thorny, um, but it likes it dry. This is one we see when there's drought. So there's a bunch of these uh, solanaceous weeds. So solanaceous is the tomato family. So tomatoes, peppers, potatoes, eggplants are in the same family as some of these weeds. So ground cherries, buffalo burr, um, henbane. Um, but anyway, they some of these like it pretty hot, especially this buffalo burr. The grassy weeds, I've talked a little bit about these already. Um, we had the hair barley and the cheek grass. There's a number of these grassy weeds. Um, they're in the monocot family. So it's important to know that you have monocots and dicots. Monocots are your grassy type leaves with parallel veins. Um, so they there's certain chemicals that will treat grass type things. And then you have certain chemicals that will treat uh, broadleaf. So well, that's why it's important to kind of know these monocot and dicot terms. So again, here's that hair barley. Um, so each little hair you see coming out of that grass head is connected to a seed. Um, so that, that little hair-like uh, follicle is called an awn. Um, and they can actually injure your dog. So it's talking about uh, grazers here. So cattle and things like that can get them stuck in their nose, but these can also get, some of these grasses can get in dog's paws and noses and it can actually travel. So they can uh, harm some of our critters. So another reason to kind of get rid of them. Bermuda grass, this is kind of the vein of my existence. I know some golfers like Bermuda grass, but when it gets into your flower beds or your vegetable bed, it's very hard to remove. This came from Africa. It seems like it roots to Africa because it just puts some deep roots down, deeper than the trees are going here. Um, so very hard one to kill. Um, very, very hard. So if you if you have any of it coming up in your yard, get rid of it quickly, <laughs> or you kind of uh, will be stuck with it for a while because you have to be very tenacious and it takes multiple applications uh, to get rid of this plant. I actually had one case though the other year where somebody was overwatering it and it was dying actually because it was overwatered. Um, but you know, it's one that prefers uh, that dry water. More pictures of the cheat, the cheat grass here, or uh, it's also called downy brome. Um, again, that's just, you know, 
going to be a fire hazard. So Amaranth are in the Lamb's Quarters family and they put a lot of seeds out. Here's another picture. So they're the pigweed or amaranth family. I actually had a guy give me some red amaranth. Um, so some people actually make uh, flower out of amaranth seeds. Some countries really use the amaranth seeds too in their diet. But he gave me some in um, Halloween decoration. I had bought, uh, a, my kids had picked up uh, some big pumpkins, some jack-o'-lanterns from him. And he's like, oh, well, you need some decorations. And he gave me some of this amaranth thing with some corn stalks. Well, I have had pigweed coming up in part of my gravel driveway. It stayed, it stayed relatively in that same spot, but it comes up and we never water. And, you know, we're talking, we get seven to 10 inches of water a year and it comes up. So I think in some ways it could be a really good crop. Um, you know, for the, for the better of the varieties. Um, but some of them can really be a weed too. So I had some red root pigweed come in, I think with maybe some irrigation water. So now that's a problem in one of my uh, vegetable beds that I've been trying to get rid of. So again, putting out lots of weeds, uh, seeds. So, so weed and water conservation, um, what can we do? So, uh, higher mowing height, we already talked about that three to three and a half inches. Um, get that lawn used to that less frequent but deeper watering. So we're getting those roots down deeper so they're more drought tolerant. Um, take care of plants so they're most valuable. To me, the trees, right? Trees can live hundreds of years for certain varieties. So we want to keep them healthy. Uh, they're going to provide a shade too. So they're going to reduce cooling costs. So very important to keep the trees around. Um, so to me, I would rather my lawn suffer a little bit and I take care of the trees. And then when we're not in drought, right, we talked about this, go ahead and make some plans for a more drought tolerant garden in the future. Another thing you can do is put down some mulch. Uh, so putting down straw or straw mulch or chips, even wood chips in between the rows of your vegetable garden is a good way to hold moisture in. Um, even using wood mulch in areas uh, maybe that are just soil or even replacing some rock because rock tends to be a little bit hotter. Going native, right? Get, get planting some of those native plants uh, or planning to plant them once we have a little moisture to get them established and take care of those weeds because they're sucking out some of the water that could be going to some of the better plants. So we want to do that. And then some other quick tips. Um, that you can do, use a broom instead of a hose, right? Outside when you're sweeping up, cleaning up, uh, use a rain sensor on your sprinkler system. So you're only irrigating when you really need moisture instead of it just being on a schedule. We say, don't set it and forget it. So um, I say to check it at least once a month and change that. And of course, if you do have a big rain, um, if you can turn it off for a few, few days, that's a good thing to do. Um, use a shutoff on your nozzle. So if you do drag the hose out and believe it or not, people that hand water by a hose are typically more efficient and conserve more water than people that have irrigation systems. I think it's because they're noticing if the things need water or not. And then only water when needed. I think um, that's something that, you know, we get in a habit of like, set the sprinkler system on, it's on a clock, I don't think about it and off we go. Um, so in summary, weeds are a problem for many reasons, right? We talked quite, about quite a few today. Uh, adaptations allow them to outcompete surrounding vegetation, potentially even harming our native plants. Weed ID is the first step in creating a management plan. And basic plant structure and biology is essential knowledge in creating a successful weed management program. Use landscape strategies to control weeds and save water like mulching plant selection, mowing height, uh, replanting when we're not in drought, and knowing when and where to water. So with that, Rachel, I am open and I'm going to stop sharing. Uh, let's see here. Oh, you're still muted, Rachel. <laughs> you think I've done this before, but apparently not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, great presentation, Susan. Thank you so oh, much thank for you. that. Really appreciated all those great tips. Um, if anyone had any questions, we do have a couple minutes left. 
uh, while we have Susan here. If you have anything you'd like to ask her, you can put that in the Q&A or the chat. And then Dakota did just include our awesome post-event survey as well. So we always love your feedback and any event recommendations that you have in the future. Um, and we'll give people just a minute or so just to see if there are any last minute questions. Sure. Definitely appreciate the content. All right, looks like someone just submitted one. So are there any recommendations on specific products to control cheat grass on an alfalfa field? Oh, um, so you could use a pre-emergent for the alfalfa field since your alfalfa is a perennial. So you would want to get that pre-emergent down probably in August. Um, and I typically don't work with pastures and hay very much. So I would call your local livestock and range <laughs> extension agent or one that has experience with that. Um, I got my director actually in Tri River area specializes in that. So he's the best with the weeds in those types of situation. But I would say definitely the pre-emergent would be one strategy to, to take care of that. And then if there's any way to keep it from going to seed because you're increasing that seed bank, but yeah, look for a, a livestock and range person. Awesome. Good advice. Thank you so much. And if we have any other specific questions about water or weeds, Susan's a great resource here. So I'll give you another minute or so to submit those. Someone is curious if white top is also known as yarrow. No. So yarrow is actually a native plant. The white yarrow is native uh, to our mountain areas very drought tolerant. Um, and then they've done a lot of breeding. So we have different colors like the yellows and the reds of the yarrow. So no, and yarrow is actually a fabulous pollinator plant. It really attracts a lot of them. So no, uh, the yarrow is going to be taller, um, you know, more foot, foot and a half, um, even up to three for some of the bigger yellow ones. Um, but no, the, the white top's going to stay fairly short. The leaf is much different. Um, the leaf on the yarrow is very finely cut, um, where the, the leaf's a little bit broader, still kind of long and thin, but um, more solid leaf on the hoary crest, or also known as the white top. Awesome. Thank you. Sure. I'm curious, any tips for bindweed? Oh, yes. Um, so, we actually did some research uh, at our location out in Grand Junction a few years ago. Uh, our entomologist was into weeds as well. And uh, probably because weeds, you know, insects get attracted to them. But we found that if you spray it in October, um, October is when it would be taking all the energy back into that root system. So just using the, the standard Roundup formula because Roundup's a brand just like Kleenex or you know other brands are. Um, so you're looking for just the uh, glyphosate or glyphosate. Some people pronounce it. Um, you're just looking for that ingredient. And there's been a lot of false um, press about that chemical. It is very safe. It is not soil active. Um, just read and follow the directions to be safe. Um, but yeah, it gets rid of it. I. I actually followed Bob's um, recommendations and I sprayed some uh, bindweed in our ute garden and it did not come back. It was, yes, fabulous. The other tip is um, don't let it go to flower because those seeds are very long lasting. So you want to get rid of that seed bank if you can. Um, so not letting it go to flower. There is a mite that you can get from the Palisade Insectary, but it has to be in non-irrigated places. So if it's in an area that you're in the future gonna plant, maybe a garden or something into, then ordering those mites and putting them out will help you. Um, but if it's already irrigated, the plant is just gonna outgrow the mites. The mites aren't gonna be able to keep up with the bindweed. So um, yeah, and then otherwise you can pull it. It would take you probably pulling the same plant about 10 times before it finally gives up. <laughs> it loses all its energy and it's it's done. So there's my tips for bindweed, but it it is a tough one. 
Fabulous. Thank you. So we'll have time for this last question here. So thank you everyone for submitting those questions. Um, so this person says they flood irrigate and they need to reseed their front lawn. So any suggestions on how not to wash it away? Ooh, um, I at a minimum would put out some weed free straw or hay and sprinkle a light layer of that on. You can get netting, um, so you could put the straw down in a light layer and then put the netting over top and pin it down. Um, so that would be a way that you could do that. Fantastic. Thank you. And because, you know, we do have this one last question. Someone is curious about bindweed in their lawn in particular. Do it, those same suggestions you just gave us still apply? Yeah, so in the lawn, it's a little bit tougher. Um, you could try to use the Roundup, the uh, glyphosate, but be really careful because it will kill the lawn as well because it's non-selective. Um, using a product like 2,4-D should help to get rid of it too, but it might take some uh, couple applications. Ideally for the 2,4-D though, you want to spot put that on because that one is soil active, so it can hurt your trees and shrubs. Um, so we only say twice a year for that chemical and just targeting where those buying weeds are and not, you know, spraying the entire yard. Fabulous. Well, Susan, do you have any parting words for us all tonight? Uh, pray for rain. <laughs> <laughs> and so hopefully those weeds are easier to pull out. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I think it's just getting them while they're young too, you know, then they're not such a big problem and harder to get rid of. And please use extension, you know, bring us some samples. If you have something in your area, you're not sure what it is. Um, we love investigating and learning. Like I said, I learn, I was telling Rachel, I learn something every day at work. And I think that's why I love my job so much is I'm always learning and, you know, what perfect way to do that in a, you know, connected to the university, so. Fabulous. Well, thank you so much. And yes, sure. like Susan said, CSU Extension is such a fantastic resource. So please let us know if we can help connect you as well. And thank you again to our wonderful series sponsor, Fossil Creek Nursery. Their information is in the chat as well. Um, and in the meantime, stay safe, stay stalwart, and go Rams. Take care, everybody. Good night. Go Rams. Good night. <laughs>